Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mr. Avian Chung and today I'm going to take you through H2 Physics Practical Planning. Now, let's open our Practical Planning a Task Manual. Before we begin today, there's a couple of things that I need you to get ready first. So you're going to get uh, you need going to need to get ready some full scap writing material and a ruler. If you haven't already done so, please go and get it now. Alright, pause the video and I'll be right here waiting for you. Okay, have you got what you need? Now let me introduce to you what planning question is all about. Now the planning paper is going to be part of paper 4, which is your practical paper, which, you're going, which is going to be your first paper that you sit for uh, this year. Now practical has got three main sections. The three main sections are firstly a one long experiment which is one hour long, secondly two short experiments also one hour long, and finally planning which is 30 minutes. So given that this is the uh, practical paper, when should you start the planning question? You might be surprised but planning you should start reading the planning question at the start of the experiment. So when the exam paper begins, what I like to do is I like to read the planning question first. Alright, and then after that I carry on doing the rest of the experiments so that I have two hours to think about the planning question while I'm doing the other experiments, okay, subconsciously. Alright, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to uh, produce a planning answer, okay, planning question answer. And it's always very, very standard, okay, the, the planning exp uh, answer is always very standard, alright. Now please turn with me to page 4 and we'll look at the parts of a planning uh, experiment. Now first of all, the first part of the planning answer that you're supposed to give is a diagram. Now the diagram is going to be very simple but it has to work. This means that things such as power supply, retort stands and other stuff should be uh, clearly drawn. Now you should also draw the instruments used to make measurements so that uh, the uh, examiner will know how you plan to use these instruments. And finally, because the drawing sometimes is not very clear, it's a good idea you must label all the things that you draw. Now, the next part of the planning answer is a brief description of the procedure that you're going to carry out. So what you're going to have to say is to clearly state what you're going to change what you're going to measure and what you are going to keep constant. So this is going to be the brief procedure. Now this method paragraph is always very very standard. First of all, you describe what you're going to vary and how you're going to vary it. Describe what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it. Describe what you're going to keep constant and how you're going to keep it constant. Then you say these two things. Repeat the trial three times and take the average reading. After that, you change the independent variables slightly and repeat steps A to D again to get a total of six sets of data. So this method paragraph is highly standard. After the method paragraph is done, we are going to look at how the data is going to be managed. Now in the paragraph on analysis of data, uh, you need to specify how certain specific derived data such as velocity and resistance are calculated. You will need to linearize the equation and then you will need to state plot a graph of the y variable against the x variable and if the equation is valid, a straight line of gradient A and vertical intercept B will be obtained. So this will be our analysis of data paragraph. After this, the next paragraph will be the quality of results. Now in the segment on the quality of results, you would mention things such as conducting preliminary trials to determine whether or not the experiment can actually be carried out or what you need to change to ensure that there is some variation in the uh, things that you're going to measure and other details to ensure quality result. Now this really differs from experiment to experiment so I can't give you a general uh, uh, answer over here. And now, our last and final paragraph will be on safety precautions. In the safety precautions paragraph, we really want to talk about a very, very important or significant safety hazards and what we should do to avoid injury. Now, try not to mention trivial details 
that won't result in a safety hazard. Okay, so over here we have summarized all everything that you need to have for a planning question. Uh, why don't you take out your mobile phone now and take a screenshot okay, of this uh, template because you're going to be using it in just a short while. Okay, I hope your screenshot is done. Uh, now we're going to continue with the planning. And what better way to do planning than to actually do a question, right? So that you know what it's about. Now, can you turn with me to page 21? All right, turn to page 21. And now that you're at page 21, let's take a look at question number one. Now let's read it together, okay? An air rifle can be used to fire small metal pellets which have a speed of 150 meters per second. When an absorbent material is placed some distance from the rifle, the pellets are observed to penetrate the material to a depth of 3 or 4 cm. Design an experiment to investigate how the depth of the penetration varies with the speed of the pellet. Your answer should include a diagram and make particular reference to the speed of the pellets, how it can be measured, how the depth of penetration is measured, and how the speed of the pellets is to be changed. Now, this question says that the pellets will leave the rifle with a fixed speed. And after that, any safety precautions which can be taken during the experiment. Now, what you have in front of you is a list of equipment together with any other standard lab apparatus that can be found in the lab. First of all, mounted air rifle, wires, stopwatch, power supply, light gates, timers, a ruler, some absorbent material, and thin aluminum foil. Okay, now let's start to analyze this question. Now, first of all, we want to highlight what we need to vary. Okay, so we need to vary the speed. Uh, and then we need to measure the penetration depth. So we measure this. Okay, All right. And then we keep everything else constant. Okay, so there's only two things. We vary the speed and then we measure the depth. Right, so let's take a look at what is our template again. What was our template? We are supposed to draw a diagram first. To keep it simple, but it has to work. Okay, now what we need to have is a little bit of imagination about what an air rifle experiment might look like. So let's try to draw a little diagram over here. We're going to start with an air rifle. It doesn't have to be very complicated, right? So this is an air rifle. Now, so we will label it as air rifle. Now in order for the air rifle to be stable, we'll have to place a vise over here. We grip it shut using a vise, right? So we write here vise. V I S E. And then we place it on a table or a stand. Okay, so this is a table. So we put it a table stand. Right? So we label this like that table or stand. Okay, so this is great. Now, uh, the bullet is going to come out of the rifle. The bullet is going to come out of the rifle and it's presumably going to hit uh, absorbent material like a cork board over here. So we're going to write here. Cork, cork. Now this cork is probably going to have to stand up on something. So we're going to have to once again put another table or stand over here. Okay, so it's a table uh, over here. And then we're going to have to put another vise over here to keep the cork uh, stable. Alright, so keep cork stable. Now, next, uh, the bullet is going to come out and we need to vary the speed of the bullet. So how are we going to vary the speed of the bullet? Now, we're going to vary the speed of the bullet by putting aluminum foil okay, across the, side, the front of the rifle. So the aluminum foil, we have a couple of sheets of aluminum foil. Let's put something here to hold it up. Let's put something here to hold it up. Okay, so we, we say we have like sheets of aluminum foil. Okay. We have aluminum foil over here. Now, we also need to measure the speed of the bullet. So we also need to measure the speed of the bullet. So as the bullet comes out, how do we measure the speed of the bullet? Well, there are these things called light gates, which, uh, which the uh, uh, question did tell us about light gates. Okay, so we should put two light gates here so that the, 
the bullet can pass through the light gates. All right, so we just draw the path of the bullet over here. Bullet, okay, and then over here we'll put light gates. Now this light gates uh, is for us to measure the speed of the bullet light gates. Okay, now the light gates work by having a certain distance between them. So we're going to put a ruler over here. Ruler over here. Okay, so this will be a ruler. So we draw some things over here. Ruler. All right, great. So the bullet is going to hit the cork and it's going to penetrate the cork to a certain depth. So the bullet will penetrate the cork to a certain depth. So we draw a little bullet hole here. Now, how are we going to measure the depth of the penetration? To measure the depth of the penetration, we can use a vernier calipers. You know, the back of the vernier caliper has got a probe, a little thing that's sticking out over here. So we can write the vernier caliper, okay, uh, which is which we are going to use, okay, to measure the the depth of the bullet penetration. Okay, now. Uh, notice that the light gates, okay, is going to be needed to to connect to something, all right, uh, in order to work. So the light gates will be connected to a computer screen, all right. So this will be a computer, uh, over here. Okay. The light gates are connected to a computer, and the connect computer is connected to a power supply. So we we should have a power supply over here. Power supply. All right, great. So this will be our complete diagram. Now, uh, it's it's a little bit messy. So, uh, you know, when you're doing the when you're doing the the a uh, diagram itself, please draw in pencil first, okay, and then later on you can erase it. So I think we have a working uh diagram over here. All right. Now, you know, I always love uh planning questions because. Uh, these planning questions give me a lot of opportunity to exercise my drawing skills. Uh, you know, I hope while you are drawing, you kind of feel the enjoyment as well. A lot of uh, youngsters, uh, myself included, we wanted to be manga artists when we were young. Too bad I never got to fulfill my dreams. But you can too. In uh, you know, you can start drawing, uh, exercising your artistic skills during uh, practical planning. All right, but keep the diagram simple. As long as all the items are listed, uh, you know, and it's workable, I think that's about enough. Right, so we have done the diagram. Now we are going to do a brief procedure. We're going to do a brief procedure. Okay, so we'll start by writing a basic procedure, an uh, overview of the experiment. This experiment will vary the speed of the rifle pellet using aluminum foil and then measure the depth of penetration. Okay, just a simple one-liner. Now, this is not actually required by the answer scheme, but it helps to keep your mind organized. All right, so well, let's begin with the planning proper. The first thing that we'll always write is set up the equipment as shown in the diagram. Now, I always like to leave one line of full scap in between blank, in between the, the uh, lines blank. This is because sometimes I think about new stuff to add and then I, I have no space to add it. So I always leave one line uh, in between, okay, blank. So set up the equipment as shown. Now we say describe what is varied and what is how it's varied. Describe what's measured and how it's measured. So first, let's fire the air rifle, okay, without any aluminum foil first. Alright, after we fire the air rifle without aluminum foil, the bullet is going to go into the cork, right? So now we need to measure two things. We need to measure the speed of the bullet and we need to measure how deep it went into the cork. Now the speed of the bullet is measured based on the time difference when it passes the first light gate and the time, the time it passes the second light gate, alright? And then the distance between them divided by the time. So this is how we're going to write it. Okay, what we'll say is that the speed of the bullet is calculated by V equals to L over delta T, where L is the separation between the light gates, and delta T is the time interval between passing the bullet passing the first and the second light gate. Okay, now so that we've got this uh, speed of the bullet, we better write down the L 
on a diagram. So we'll write down L on this diagram over here, okay, where L is the distance between the two light gates. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the distance L and how we obtain this distance. We should specify that the distance L has been measured using a ruler and that this distance will be kept constant throughout the entire experiment. Okay, so the separation between the light gates L is measured using a ruler and this distance should be kept constant throughout the experiment. Now, we need to measure the depth of penetration. So we'll just say that we are going to measure the depth of penetration using the probe of the vernier calipers. After we mentioned about the penetration depth, we now need to repeat the experiment a couple of times in order to get an average penetration depth. Okay, so we say repeat the trial three times and take the average penetration depth. Okay, now that we've repeated the trial three times, it's time to slow down the bullet. So we're going to add aluminum foil, okay, so that between the path of the gun and the, the target, so that the bullet will be slowed down. So we say add aluminum foil to the holder between the rifle and the light gates to slow down the pellets. And then we repeat the experiment again okay from step 3 to step 7 until six, at least 6 sets of data are obtained okay so fire the rifle again and repeat the experiment from step 3 to step 7 until at least 6 sets of data are obtained now we haven't mentioned yet what are the things that will keep constant so now is about the good time to uh, mention all the control variables so over here in this long statement, we say throughout the experiment, keep the relative orientation of the rifle, the light gates and aluminum foil and target constant by using a vise to hold the rifle steady. The distance between the rifle and the target should also be kept constant by measuring it with a measuring tape. So we don't just say that we keep it constant, we say how is it kept constant. So now this uh, this has already been, uh, we are already done up to the method. Okay, we have covered the diagram, we have covered the brief procedure, we've covered the method, what is varied, what is measured, and what is kept constant, and that we have repeated the trial three times and taken the average reading, and also changed the independent variable by adding more aluminum foil to slow down the uh, bullet. Now we are going to do analysis of data such as how uh, the velocity and resistance are calculated, linearization of equation and so on. Okay, so for the part 4 analysis of data, you will notice that the question did not give us any equations uh, in order for us to, to linearize. Now when no equation is given, then we need to come up with our own equation. All right, so we need to come up with our own equation and I'll start over here okay with paragraph number 10 assume okay we so we need to assume that the speed and the depth of penetration are related by a particular relationship this is called a power law relationship so this is the uh, language that you can use when no equation is given you have to come up with your own equation assume the speed of the bullet v and depth of penetration d are related by a power law relationship. The penetration depth is equal to a v to the power of n, where a and n are constants to be determined. Okay, so when no no equation is given, you have to come up with your own equation. Now the next thing we're going to have to do is to linearize the equation. So this is what we're going to write. Take ln of both sides. So ln d equals to n ln v plus ln a, and then we'll write this. Plot a graph of ln d against ln b. If the relationship is valid, a straight line graph with gradient n and vertical intercept ln a will be obtained. Does it seem familiar? We basically write this for every experiment, right? In fact, you'll be writing it during the long experiment, so you can copy that part over. Now, by this time, we have finished uh, paragraph 4, which is the analysis of the results. Of the data. So now we're going on to paragraph 5, which is to ensure the quality of the results. Now, one thing that I'm not very sure of is that 
will this aluminum foil actually work to slow down the bullet or is the bullet going to punch through all the aluminum foil without even slowing down? Now to ensure that the aluminum foil can actually slow down the bullet, we need to take some preliminary readings before we start the experiment. So this is what we can write, preliminary readings. To ensure that the aluminum foil can slow down the bullet, do a preliminary trial to determine what is the maximum number of aluminum foils that the bullet can go through and still hit the target. So this will be the upper limit of the number of foils. Now, doing a preliminary reading is going to help you carry out the experiment properly. So it is counted as one of the quality factors that can be awarded marks. Now, as we do the experiment, we should also think about what will happen after we carry out the experiment many times. So let's take a look. After we keep shooting the target, this target is going to be quite beaten up and it's going to basically fall to pieces. So it's, not, it's going to affect our readings because we need the bullet to hit a fresh part of the cork every time. So maybe one of the things that we can do to ensure quality is that we can change the cork after every few trials to ensure that the bullet hits a fresh section of cork uh, so that the strength of the target material is kept constant. All right, so uh, please note that when we write our explanations, we have to be very, very specific at what we're trying to achieve. So we can't just say, change the cork after every few rounds. No, that's not a sufficient explanation. We must explain why, why, and why, and how does it affect the quality of the results. Now, finally, this uh, we come to the section on safety and as you know, we're going to do an air rifle trial and the, it's a very very dangerous experiment because an air rifle bullet has the potential to injure someone or even kill someone. So the safety, the significant safety factor is that we need to conduct the experiment in a very safe environment. Of course, air rifles should only be used in an air rifle range and we must ensure that there's no one standing down the range before the experiment is carried out so that we can avoid anyone getting injured by stray pellets. Now, think about it that usually air rifle rounds hit the target over here and you know it's quite safe. But what we're going to do is that we're actually going to put an aluminum foil in front of the gun as we fire it. So this might actually be a little bit dangerous. So let's write another safety precaution. When a bullet hits the aluminum foil, shrapnel or pieces might actually fly out and injure someone. So what we need to do is that we need to ensure the area around the front of the rifle is clear of all personnel before firing. Okay, so now we've got 15 paragraphs. I think that's really enough. Considering that there's only 12 marks for the planning exercise, I think that's quite enough for us to get a high score. Okay, so I hope you see that the planning exercise is quite doable and a lot of it is common sense. So the most important thing to have during the planning exercise is imagination. You must run through in your head how the experiment is going to take place. Okay, so why don't you uh, take out your phones or whatever and take a screen grab of this uh, planning exercise, transfer it onto your full scap and this will serve as a template for you to use for the next few planning exercises. Okay, so I'll give you some time to take a screenshot. Okay, now that we know how to do the template for a single variable kind of experiment, I'm now going to introduce to you a new kind of uh, planning question that has two variables for you to change. Now, I'd like you to turn with me down all the way to page 43. Okay, turn to page 43. Uh, and let's take a look at this question number 26 from MJC prelim 2017. All right, come turn to page 43. I'll give you some time to reach that page. Okay, let's read the question. Each of the propellers on the drone consists of two or more blades connected to a motor shaft. As the motor replaces, uh, this results in a truss on the propeller hence lifting the drone. Figure 4.1 shows such a propeller used in the drone. The speed or rotation of the motor is determined by the power supply. A student suggests that the average thrust on the propeller depends on the rotational speed omega, the blade angle and the density of air. So the relationship between the average thrust 
uh, omega and theta may be written in the form t equals to k omega to the power of a sine to the power of b theta. Right, k, a, and b are constants. So, design an experiment to determine the values of k, a, and b. You are provided with a number of propellers with different blade angles indicated, a tachometer that can measure the rotational speed of a shaft, and an electronic balance. All right. So let's take a look at what we need to vary and what we need to uh, measure and what we need to keep constant. So notice that we need to measure the thrust, T, but we also need to vary two things. We need to vary omega and vary theta. So this experiment will be carried out in two parts. Okay. Now in part one, we will uh, vary omega and then in part two, we will vary theta. So maybe you can kind of like plan in your mind, okay, that this experiment will take place in two parts. So why don't we write the basic procedure first? So our part one will be to measure the thrust uh, T while varying the rotational speed or uh, omega, uh, keeping all other factors constant. And then in part two, we're going to measure the thrust while varying the blade angle, keeping all other factors constant. So let's begin by drawing a diagram of how we're going to do this. Now the special thing about this diagram is that we're going to need to include a power supply as well. So why don't we draw a rotor over here. Okay, this is our uh, rotor blade. Okay, so it doesn't have to be very special. So we just label this. This is the rotor blade. Okay. Now, in order to measure thrust, we should connect the rotor blade onto a digital weighing balance over here. So this is a, we can draw this and then we say this is a digital balance, okay, a weighing scale. Okay, and then over here we can say this is the support, okay. Now, so the rotor blade, uh, there are two ways we can angle it. We can an angle it such that the wind comes down this way, or we can angle it such that the wind goes up this way. Now, it's obviously better to have the wind blow upwards because we don't want the wind blowing on a digital weighing scale and then shaking the scale uh, up and down. Okay. Now, in order to power the rotor blade, we'll need to connect it to a power source. So here's a battery. But then again, in order for the uh, power to be varied, we're going to need to include a rheostat or variable resistor. Okay, now always include a switch as well. Okay, so that you can uh, make sure that the, the motor can be turned off for safety reasons. So over here, you can have a power supply, power supply, and then over here, we can have a variable resistor, and over here, we can have a switch. Right, so uh, I think that's that's about uh, what we need. Now we need to have some way to measure the rotational speed of the blade. So we're going to include a tachometer here, a laser tachometer that can sense the rotation speed of the blade. Now I don't know what a tachometer looks like. So if you don't know what a tachometer looks like, okay, just write, uh, just draw a box and then just say tachometer. Right. So later on you can check. Inside the lecture notes, there's a there's a, 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 a information telling you what all the different meters look like. So here we have a complete diagram of the rotor blade, complete with power supply and variable resistor and so on. So the diagram part is done, as well as the basic procedure is also done. Now next is the method. Remember to leave one space in between each line. We can always start by saying set up the equipment as shown right and then after that we can start step two now before we start taking any measurements or we turn on the blade we really need to start uh, by tearing the digital weighing scale to set it to zero and then once the digital weighing scale is set to zero we can then turn on the rotor blade and take some measurements now what measurements are we going to take we're going to use the tachometer to measure the rotational speed of the blade. And we're going to use the weighing scale to record the reading on the weighing scale. Now, 
Since the weighing scale we expect it to fluctuate, we should take the reading three times and then take the average. Alright, now that we have the reading on the weighing scale, how are we going to uh, get uh, several sets of data? Now we're going to uh, decrease the resistance on the variable resistor so that the rotor blade spins faster. And then we take six sets of readings of this. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Decrease the resistance on the variable resistor so the blade spins faster. And then repeat uh, steps of four to six, sorry, not three to six, steps four to six, and then obtain at least six sets of readings. Now, throughout this time, uh, what are we going to keep constant? We'll mention that later. Okay, so part one is done. Uh, not yet done. Now we're going to talk about how to analyze the data for part one. Okay, let's take a look at, at the equation that we have uh, over here. The relationship can be locked in order to get this. Now, we know that omega is the variable, and in this case, k sine theta is the constant. So we're going to get this variable out. Okay, so what we can plot is ln t and, and a ln omega. But how do we get t in the first place? Now we'll say that t is calculated from t equals mg, where m is the reading on the wing scale and g is the gravitational acceleration. So now we can plot ln t against ln omega to obtain a. If we plot ln t against ln omega, a straight line graph will be obtained with gradient a. Now we're kind of done with part one. Okay, so we'll carry on with part two. Now in part two, we need to uh, change the independent variable that we are uh, measuring. So here's how to write the overview for part 2. For part 2, we will measure the truss while varying the angle of the blade. Alright, so after selecting a blade of known angle theta, we'll tear the wing scale to set the zero reading. Next, we'll close the switch and record the reading of the scale while measuring the rotation speed of the blade. Take three readings of the scale and calculate the average. Now, we're going to open the switch, change the blade, and then repeat the experiment. Now, so we'll change the blade, and then we will repeat the experiment from step 2 to step 4. However, we need to adjust the resistor to obtain the same rotation speed each time. Okay. Now, now that we have our values, we're going to uh, plot a new graph for part 2. So we linearize the equation as ln t is equals to b ln sine theta. Now this is the variable and this is the y-intercept. So when we plot ln t against ln sine theta, a straight line graph will be obtained with gradient b. Now, So now we've obtained a and b, we also need to obtain k. Now this can be done by substituting values back into the original equation. So we can substitute the values of a and b into the equation in order to obtain the value of k. Okay, so now we have done the method as well as the analysis of variables for part one and part two. Okay, so we have to talk about what we are going to keep constant for each experiment. So one of the uh, uh, control of variables that we want to talk about is that we have to control the temperature or density of the air. Now, since the question clearly stated that the thrust is also dependent on the density of air, we need to control the density of the air by ensuring the experiment is conducted in a temperature controlled room, such as an aircon room. So now, how do we ensure the quality of the results? Okay, to ensure the quality of the results, we might want to take a preliminary reading so if the blade spins too fast, you know, there's a chance that it might become unstable because after all, it is it can you know, fly into space. So before the experiment, we want to find out what is the maximum speed that the blade can spin before becoming unstable and we do not exceed this speed during the experiment. Now we also want to make sure that the blade is positioned so that the wind blows upwards so that it doesn't affect the wing scale reading. Now finally, it's time for us to take safety precautions. Alright, so the safety precautions that we might want to take is to make sure that we don't get cut by the spinning blade and to make sure that the blade doesn't fly off. So fasten the blade to the supports using tape or glue and fasten the supports to the wing scale so that the blade does not fly off or become unstable. 
Okay, so with two safety precautions, I think uh, that is quite sufficient. So this will be the completed uh, planning. Uh, make sure to copy it down onto your planning sheet and you can use this as a template for future planning. Okay, I'm sorry if the font is a little bit small. So now that we have learned how to do a single variable experiment and how to do a double variable experiment, it's time for you to do some homework. I'd like you to turn with me to page 23 and question 4. Okay, I will set this question for you as homework. So take the rest of this period to prepare a planning experiment for question 4 and then submit it to your tutor via SLS. This will be taken as proof of your attendance during this SLS session. Now, thank you and I'll see you again for the next lecture and we'll, in the next uh, planning lecture, we'll go through some more questions. Alright, bye-bye.